Thank you, guys. That was wonderful. I love that song. Good morning to you. You know, I have a... Uh, there, there's a, there's a, a scholar out of uh, UK, uh, Oxford University. He's in his 80s now, but he was uh, quite influential for a while. His name uh, uh, is Richard Swinburne. And he, one of his books, he's got many, but one of his books uh, titled The Existence of God, he, uh, he, he takes what I think is the, it's the, called the Bay Theory. But anyway, this is an academic, so he takes, he takes academic principles and he wants, through these theories, uh, he wants to uh, assess the probability of the existence of God. The probability of the existence of God. And so he does this and uh, basically concludes that, you know, it's, it's a, honestly about 50-50. I mean, he's got a 50-50 probability. Uh, he said that there's an there's a, there's a absolute credible case argument to be made for the existence of God. At the same time, there's, there's a credible argument against the existence of God. But he goes on, and he does more uh, and analysis, and he uh, then says what, what tips it for, for the existence of God, according to Swinburne, are religious experiences. Religious experiences. So I wonder, you know, I, I mean, I've, I've asked myself, and you know, it's like, what is a religious experience? And by the way, Swinburne does a good job of sort of defining them. I mean, uh, it's something that's life-changing. It's specific. It's, it's God or a kind of a representative God like an angel intervening in somebody's life. Um, and so, so he, I, I'm not going to go into it all, but he, he goes into it. He also does a good job of uh, kind of getting away from what you might suspect could be problematic, right? Like somebody had too much wine last night. Or maybe they were, you know, in the mushroom patch and maybe picked the wrong cup time or something like that. So uh, he does a good job of saying, no, it's not about sort of this vague sensation. It's, this is a concrete, you know, experience that somebody's had. And so this quarter, uh, my, uh, in seminary, I, I took a class called Apologetics on Apologetics. And uh, one of my classmates is a missionary in West Africa, and he and his uh, wife and two children are over there. They have been for five years. And so I got to learn a little bit about his uh, experiences there. We have discussions as part of the class. I also got to, to learn about uh, a religious experience that he's had. And so when I uh, learned about that, it's, it, it's very concrete. It was a call. It was a call that he had, and that's why he's in West Africa today uh, as a missionary. And so uh, I, I take that in, and I, you know, I, I've gotten to know him this quarter. Uh, granted, it's online, but, uh, you know, you, wonderful guy. Bright, smart. I believe he had a religious experience. So the question is, uh, for, for, I guess, I'll, I'll pose to you, is, is does God communicate with us? Because Swinburne also says that if you believe in the existence of God, he, he says, there's a really good probability that God's going to reach out to you and communicate to you. So I would say from my standpoint, I'm, I'm also, and, and you're going to, I'm going to try to bring this out a little bit today, this whole idea of, that's a little, can get a little mystical. I like the concrete. You know, I like to keep my feet on the floor. I like, you know, I, and, and I'm receptive to both. I do believe that God speaks to us. I think he speaks to us through his word. I think he speaks into our heart through his Holy Spirit. I believe that he absolutely, and I've experienced this, speaks through other people. And oftentimes I don't think they know it. But you know it. And I think that he speaks through our circumstances. And we're going to see that in the text today. And I use this word religious experiences also on purpose because... uh, we're, our text that Pastor Shaw gave me is in Daniel chapter 7, and there's two parts to Daniel. The first part is narrative stories. You remember not that long ago, Dan, uh, Pastor Shaw uh, preached on uh, the fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Ab- Abednego. Anybody, anybody listen to that? Some of you. Uh, there's, uh, of course, prayer. Daniel's prayer life got him thrown into the den of lions. Uh, there's that story. There's others, and I'm going to kind of go through one quickly. 
to, uh, today. But chapter 7 through 12 it, are religious experiences. I, should have t- I shouldn't say that because we're gonna, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to contradict myself here in a minute. But uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and let it, let, it, let it rest at that. But this is an intense period in the history of Israel. And I'm going to say to you that I believe it's extremely relevant for us right now today. And as you think about uh, these religious experiences, their visions, Daniel's having a vision. And uh, as you think about that, and as I reflect, I wanted to like, okay, how could, how can we kind of keep, keep, keep on the ground here? And I want you to think about three points, and I hope you'll leave with them. And they're communication, tension, and turning point. The communication maybe I'm starting to bring out is that I'm going to submit to you. It's like, do you believe that God communicates with you? Does God speak to you? And are you speaking back? Because I believe that a lot of times God's like the last person we want to take our problems to. A lot of times we wait for the last second and it's an emergency and we want just an outright a miracle, right? <clears throat> And we're going to see a little bit of that. We're going to, we're going to see some kind of odd behavior out of Daniel uh, here this morning in that, in that regard. And then I want you to hang on to communication, and then I want you to hang on to the tension. You're going to see tension in what you're going to read about, and, and I think that that's real. I think that we have tension in this world. And I think if we're all honest with ourselves, it's there. We can hide it. We can, we can draw boundaries and barriers to kind of keep it shut out. But there's tension in this world. Pastor Shaw's in the midst of tension this last week in Hawaii with the shootings there that were close by him. He's probably, you know, interacting. He's, I think he's, he's doing these three steps. He's communicating. He's praying. I know he is. And he's walking into tension. We have a Savior who walked into tension, didn't walk away from it, didn't try to block it out. That's what Jesus did. The question for us is will we turn to him? That's the turning point. God gives us choice. Another uh, theologian I like a lot is Planiga, and I won't go there, other than Planiga does a, a, a great free will uh, paper that, you know, if God wants relationship from us, that's Planiga's point. He, he wants relationship. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, that's relationship. And God exists, and he wants a relationship through his Son with us. And True relationship is free will. Would you want somebody in a relationship with you that you had to force them into the relationship? God could, can, he could, right? But he doesn't. And that's Planicus' point. He gives us the free will. He wants us to choose the relationship. That's the turning point. He gives us choices. We're going to see some contrast, some choices. Communication, tension, turning point. And I want to start with Daniel, the text, and then I want to go out in concentric circles. So I want to talk about Daniel, and then I want to talk about his time, roughly 600 B.C. to 550 B.C., and then I want to go out from there. Because the thing about Daniel is he has inspired a lot of prophecy in the Bible, whether he's called out or not. It's there. It's all over the New Testament. I'll get to that in a second. Let me, uh, let me read you our text. This is Jan- Daniel, uh, the book of Daniel. I'm going I'm to go to chapter 7, and then I'm going to come back. The next concentric circle I'm going to go to is uh, chapter 2. Chapter 2 that's going to inform very much this text in, cha- in chapter 7. So listen to this. It's not very long. Um, 13 and 14 is the text. This is from Daniel, chapter 7. As I continued to watch this night vision of mine, I suddenly saw one like a human being coming with the heavenly clouds. He came to the ancient one and was presented before him. Rule, glory, and kingship were given to him. All peoples, nations, and languages will serve him. His rule is an everlasting one. It will never pass away. His kingship 
is indestructible. That's Daniel chapter 7. Those are bold words. I want to call your attention to something where it says human being, and I'm my, my version, I happen to like common English Bible, CEB, and I might be a little weird, and I'm sorry. Uh, a lot of you might be on NIV or NRSV or ESV or... Uh, there's not many people in King James Version anymore. But anyway, that's a whole other thing. I, I'm not going to digress. But you, this word human being, you'll, 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 you'll read in Scripture, it, in your uh, translation, it may say uh, human one. It may say son of man. For example, Ezekiel, talk a little bit about him in a second. He's a contemporary of Daniel. He's just a little white. Daniel's in the heart of Babylon. He's, in the, he's, he's serving under King Nebuchadnezzar. That's where Daniel is. Ezekiel is just up the river a ways, a little tributary called the Shebar River, and the prophet Ezekiel is up there, and he's prophesying. You could read his book. It's a wonderful book uh, by the prophet Ezekiel. So God speaks to Ezekiel as human one or son of man. So I want you to make that distinction here. This doesn't say human one or son of man. If your translation says son of man, it says before son of man. It says, it says one like a son of man. It's very important. The other thing that uh, I'll call your attention to is the ancient one. Because we have two divine beings here. One like a son of man, who I'm going to submit to you, is Jesus. It's Jesus. If you go to Revelation chapter 1 or chapter 14, you'll see the same language. One like a son of man. From John, who's having a vision on the island of Patmos, 600 years after Daniel. You're going to see the same language. It's referring to Jesus. And I'm not going to spend time in Revelation, but I want to call your attention to that. So you have two divine beings. And I'm going to submit the reason you don't hear from the Holy Spirit, you do hear from the Holy Spirit in Revelation, but we haven't gotten to Pentecost yet. The Holy Spirit hasn't come yet. Remember, Jesus said, when I'm raised, I'll draw all people unto me, but I'll send one, the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, the Giver of, who, who will make testimony to me into our hearts, the Holy Spirit. So what I want you to know is, if you go to Revelation, you'll hear from the Holy Spirit. In Revelation, you hear from Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But here we are in Daniel. Where, uh, he's, he's having this vision in around 550 B.C., and I want to make a concentric circle outward, okay? And I want to look at Daniel chapter 2. Now, this is a distinct story. Uh, remember, first half of Daniel's narrative, second half, visions, religious experiences, although I'm going to contradict myself. And I'm going to paraphrase. I'm not going to read you the whole chapter. But starting uh, with, I want, to, I, want to, I want to not let go of these three points. I want you to look for the communication, the tension, and the turning point. Right? And, I want, and I'm just submitting to you. This is useful to me. I hope it is to you. Because I think that's real life for us. I think God does communicate with us. And there, there's tension. There's going to be tension. If we're turning to him and talking back, Expect tension. It's, it's in the world. But we then have choice. Are we turn to God or are we going to turn to the world? Which one? And so I want you to look for that communication. In chapter 2, it begins like this. In the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's rule, he had many dreams. The dreams made him anxious. Okay? So there's my contradiction. It seems that Nebuchadnezzar's having a religious experience too. Which to me is is sort of like, do you ever have people in your life? You know, it's like this whole idea. I mean, we're we're called, and I agree, we're called into mission to make disciples. But but the question is, is do we sometimes jump too far out ahead of God? Think it's it's our, you know, we're 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 gonna save the day? Do we ever have loved ones that maybe we we want to we hope that they're going to have a faith walk or we want them to turn to Christ. Or, you know, I've talked to people that, you know, have people they care about are in pretty bad places, you know, and, they're, and they just so badly want, you know, this person to turn to, right? That's okay. That's good, right? And it's okay to pray for those people that are in our family or our, our circles, our friends. That's okay. 
But we also, we don't want to get too far behind. We know it's our job to witness. But I'm going to submit, sometimes are we a little bit too impatient and we want to do God's work for him? <laughs> we want to see that person get to church, right? Maybe we better, maybe what we ought to do is be a little bit more patient and look to God and realize this about God, and you're going to see that in this text. Daniel's going to get in front of Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel's going to witness to Nebuchadnezzar, okay, in this chapter. I'll just tell you. But he's not there yet. Nebuchadnezzar's going to address all of his sages from uh, the, the Chaldees there in Babylon. He's got seers and sages, and he's lumped Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're from Israel. He's just lumped them in with a whole bunch of other sages and seers that are there. So the first people that, that Nebuchadnezzar goes to is them, the Chaldeans, right? And he says, I'm having these dreams. I'm feeling a lot of anxiety. If you're the king of the world and there's nobody can test you, you get whatever. You, you can demand, right? And that's part of, see what's going on here. These, that's going to get peeled back in this book of Daniel. It's like that choice, that turning point. Are you going to listen to Nebuchadnezzar or are you going to listen to God? See, Daniel faced that every day. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego faced it with the fiery furnace, right? The golden image. You didn't, you're not falling down and worshiping my golden image? End of the furnace. That's what people like Nebuchadnezzar can do. That's the power that's in this world. So he wants these seers to figure out for him and to translate his dream, and they can't do it. They said, nobody can do that. No human, Right? So that's Daniel's challenge, right? And Daniel's going to get enlisted to it. I'm going to paraphrase. But I want to then, that's the communication to Nebuchadnezzar. Listen to the tension. The king, so, so the seers say, nobody can do it. Uh, you know, long live the king. They kind of suck up to him and try to, you know, whatever, get him to, you know, show a little bit of leniency, right? These are the Chaldean seers. Uh, this is what Nebuchadnezzar says. The king answered, my decision is final. If you can't tell me the dream and its meaning, you will be torn limb from limb and your houses will be turned into trash dumps. Do you see the tension? That's tension. And that's the tension that Daniel's going to deal with, right? Because they, he's, gonna, he's right in there with that bunch of people. They're all coming to Daniel, right? And so here's the turning point. And it's a little odd turning point, too. Because in Daniel uh, is, is a man that uh, he's known for his nonviolent resistance. Nonviolent resistance. He doesn't, he doesn't worship. Well, you know, I'm going to take a little liberties with the story, but he, he's not going to fall down and worship the golden image. It's right at the beginning of, of Daniel. You, you hear about his diet. He says, I'm, I'm not going to eat this food that, that the king puts in front of me and drink the king's wine. I've, I'm going to follow God's diet. I'm not going to go there, but Daniel is a man that's, that believes in God. He's in communication with God. He prays three times a day. It's in Daniel. Three times a day. But when the tension gets thick, when it gets life or death, he's going to turn to God. He's going to communicate with God. But watch what he does, because this is the turning point. And it's in chapter 2, 17. Daniel went and asked the king to give him some time so he explained the dream's meaning to him. Then Daniel went to his house and explained the situation to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Those are the Hebrew names of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Those, those three names are Babylonian names. The ones I just gave you are the Hebrew, same people, just the Hebrew names. So what does Daniel do? He's got this relationship with God, but... He, he's, he calls his, his, his friends, his fellow believers, and he, he confides in them. He gets them to pray, right? I think there's a message, you know? We're not alone in this world. That's what, what you hear. If you're contemplating, you know, coming back, or if you're, contempl you're indecisive about a life group or something like that, why don't you just do it? Just fling yourself in. You know, if you have, you know, like get involved. Take a chance. I think, as I, as I mentioned, I, another... A book review I had to do this quarter was on uh, an, by an atheist author. And uh, he, he's a sociologist and he's a researcher in, in Denmark and Sweden. Really fascinating book. 
is like a society without God. Phil Zuckerman. And uh, one thing I think about as I read it is like, you know, I, I think he, he has a lot of conclusions about God, but I don't see that he really has really genuinely turned and tried to communicate with God, right? He hasn't really turned to God, and he can do that privately in the privately of his home, and God encourages us to do that. God just doesn't, Jesus says, don't go out and pray in public. Those people get their reward. Go close your door. Be in private. So, I want to uh, go out another concentric circle real quickly, but I want to make a point that God gives Daniel the interpretation. Daniel gives it to the king. Uh, I want to see the, you to see Daniel's communication after, after God reveals Nebuchadnezzar's dream, right? I just want to read to you what Daniel says to God. He says back. Because communication is a two-way street. You know, if you're listening to God through his word, if you're paying attention in the circumstances of your life, if you're okay with You know, the fact that probably there are people, God's speaking through other people. The question is, are you listening, right? Uh, and, and, uh, And God's speaking into your heart. But you know what? We can block that. We can turn our back on God. He gives us that choice. But if we're paying attention to him, listening, that communication's a two-way street. So Daniel speaks back. And this is what Daniel says. Daniel praised the God of heaven, and he said, God's name be praised from age to eternal age. Wisdom and might are his. God is the one who changes times and eras, who dethrones one king only to establish another, who grants wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those with insight. God is the one who uncovers what lies deeply hidden. He knows what hides in darkness. Light lives with him. I acknowledge and praise you, my Father's God. You've given me wisdom and might, and now you've made known to me what was asked of you, what we asked of you. You've made known to us the king's demand. And really quickly, I want to uh, call your attention to someone, something. Chapter 7, remember that text, 13 and 14, if, you can, if it's kind of familiar. Now, I want to read you the second chapter. This is the end of the chapter, right? Uh, Daniel's going to witness to Nebuchadnezzar. And the odd thing is, Nebuchadnezzar responds. He says, wow, I believe in your God, Daniel. But then he kind of turns his back somewhere down the line. But this is Daniel's witness. Daniel's kind of like Paul here a little bit. Daniel says, he's going to, now he's going to prophesy. He says to Nebuchadnezzar, but in the days of those kings, he's referring to these earthly kings that Daniel, that Nebuchadnezzar's dream contained. He's, he was the first king, and it went on through Alexander the Great. That gets disputed. I'm not going there. I'm just saying that there were some earthly regimes. They come and go. You heard that in Daniel's praise. What who, what who, who doesn't come and go is God, is the living God. He doesn't, he doesn't come and go. But kings of this earth, I heard Tim Keller and Matt referenced him uh, preach one time, and he, he asked, what does Hitler, Mao, Zedong, and, and Stalin all have in common? They're dead. They're all dead. Right? They don't last. That threat that Nebuchadnezzar made, he made it then, but he can't make it now. He can't make it now. So Daniel says, but in, those, in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will raise up an everlasting kingdom. And remember the text from chapter 7, God will raise up an everlasting kingdom that will be indestructible. There it is. That's the prophecy. That's what, what God puts out there through Daniel. For us. Now, I want to quickly. Uh, I want to quickly just draw. I think I'll, I'll, I'll go. I'm going to go fast on this, but I want to give you a little context. What was going on there at that time? Because it's the fall of the the southern kingdom of Judah. Israel. God called Israel out of Egypt, and they were slaves. He didn't call them because they were smart, intelligent, strong. He called them because they were low. God likes to make something out of nothing. That's what he does. He does that kind of work. And he called Israel and put them out there to be a light to the nations. You go back to Genesis. You go back. 
Abraham, God's promise to Abraham, I'm going to bless all nations through you. God's program has always included the whole world, all peoples, all races. <laughs> there is, I, I cringe when I hear people uh, reference like the area of slavery in America. And, and, and I had one African-American student, and, and he was talking about what the white man's religion. And I just like, oh, man, it makes me weep. There is no white man's religion. I mean, Christianity is not it. Christianity is an event. It's, it's more event than it is religion. I don't know how that sounds to you, but it's true. Jesus Christ was Jewish. He came out of Judaism. He, he was a happening in flesh and blood. He came with his word. He didn't come in and say, guess what? I'm going to start a new religion, and I'm going to call it Christianity. It grew. It grew out of that event of his death and resurrection. It's an event. For somebody to lay claim to it and say, no, that's, I'm going to make it my religion. Huh? I mean, there's, there's some truth to that, but if you want to take ownership and exclude people, that's a problem. Because the gospel speaks to every culture, and that's been God's program from the start. But Israel turned their back on God. And he sent his prophets. I'm just going to read to you really ever so fast. Uh, Jeremiah 25, verse 4. This is what Jeremiah says. In fact, he's talking to the Israelites. In fact, the Lord has tirelessly sent you all his, all his servants, the prophets, but you wouldn't listen. You wouldn't pay attention. You can't have communication if we're not listening, right? You can't have it. And God, at some point, will give up. But he went decades and decades and prophets and prophets, he sent to him. He said, turn back to me. I'll save you. I'll make it. I'll correct it. They wouldn't do it. So the biting in the books of Jeremiah, the language in the books of Jeremiah, Ezekiel, 2nd Isaiah, which is Isaiah 40 to 55, it's wonderful poetry, it's narrative. Some of the words from God is pretty, pretty threatening. It's pretty biting. Biting. He says, I'm going to call Nebuchadnezzar down. He's going, to, I'm, he's going to burn Jerusalem and my temple to the ground. And that's exactly what happened in 586, 587 B.C. Burned it to the ground. So this is what God said through his prophet Ezekiel. He said to me, human one, there's that human one. Do you see what they are doing? God's referring to the Israelites. The terrible, detestable practices that the house of Israel is doing here that drive me far from my sanctuary. Yet you will see even more detestable practices than these. God's giving Ezekiel a vision of this. This is in chapter 8. Israel's turned, and that biting language, this is how I see it. This is how I interpret it. God gave them what they wanted. They were worshiping the gods of the other nations, including child sacrifice. God says, I'm not going to be, my name's not going to be on that. You're not going to come into my sanctuary with that kind of detestable stuff. And if you read through what, what God says in those, through those prophets, including Daniel, Daniel's a little different, He's kind of a little special. You know, special is a bad word, but a little different. But if you, you read the themes, idolatry, right? Social injustice. They weren't taking care of the poor. God wants us to take care of the poor. He loves poor. He, lo he loves the oppressed, and he expects his people to take care of them. And, and there was corruption. God hates corruption. He hates people taking advantage of one another. He hates it. I, I shouldn't speak for him. I'm just reading through his word. That's all. I'm just reading what's there. Those three themes are in all of those, the words of all of those prophets. And so, in those prophets, you see the communication in Jeremiah. You see the tension. Oh, the tension was thick. And you see the choices that God brought them to. And they don't all turn to him. A lot of people don't, at least yet. <laughs> we worship a God in Jesus Christ that we just, that we just talked about. He, he, he's not going away. He's not going away. 
And so that last concentric circle, so, so I'm kind of, you can see how this, this communication, this, this tension, this, uh, you know, these, these, uh, these options to then turn, what is the, where's the turning point? It's the choice is, are we turning to the world or are we turning to God? And sometimes that choice is a hard one. I mean, I could read about choices that are a whole lot harder than I would want to face, right? including our Lord in the garden, right? Father, if there's a way, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Hmm? Can you imagine the choice that he faced for you and me? There's a choice. Are we going to turn to the world or are we going to turn to God? There's another choice that I've kind of drawn out because I believe this hot spot around this period where uh, uh, the destruction of the sacred city, Jerusalem, the, the, the legacy of David, the kingship, which was wiped out, the temple, which was burned to the ground, that may have been 700 years ago, but I'm going to submit to you there's a lot of similarities today. There's a lot of similarities to life in Babylon uh, compared to life in our world right now. I mean, who's got the power? You and me? I don't, I don't have any power, really. And if I have some power as a manager, I pray to God. I don't abuse it. But who's got the power? And what choices do we have? And are we going to buy into The question is, is what's controlling our lives? Right? I mean, who's really on your heart? Who or what? What's most important to you, most sacred, most precious? Is it God? That's the question. And there's another contrast here. There's tradition. Because the Israelites, I want to tell you, they, they checked all the boxes. I mean, you, you, you heard Dr. Adams preach last week, and he referenced uh, cultural religion. It's a reality. Phil Zuckerman, over in Denmark and Sweden, there's about... 80 registered Christians, you know, they go to the church, right, and they get baptized, they get married, but there's only about 20% of them believe in God as a supernatural living being. (laughs) Did you catch that ratio? It's cultural religion. It's cozy stuff. It's warm fires. Nothing against the warm fire. Eggnog feels good. Feels good. But it's not real. And I'm here to give witness to a real Savior, a living God. But that's the choice. Do you want to buy into tradition or do you believe in prophecy? Do you believe Daniel and Ezekiel and Jeremiah? Do you believe them? It's your choice. So I want to finish uh, with uh, the, the concentric circle then that, that has no end. The one that's indestructible. It's going to go on with or without people like me, right? It's that, it's, that, it's that concentric circle then that goes out and think about the communication that you're going to hear about over Christmas here about when the angels came to the shepherds, right? Remember what they said, right? Behold, unto you this day is born what? A Savior. Unto you this day is born a Savior. There's the communication. Look how fast the tension came. It barely could even make it into Scripture, but a little ways down, Herod puts a hit out on Jesus. The tension, right? Look at Jesus when he has to go out in the wilderness and be tempted by the devil. Look what it's come right before in all three of the synoptic Gospels. His baptism. He gets baptized by John and tempted by the devil. The tension. But there was a turning point. Remember what his turning point was? It is written. It is written. It is written. And that should be our turning point. There's the communication. Unto you, unto us, a Savior is born. And he is Christ the Lord. Which way will we turn to him? Right? And talk back. I want to read you something very briefly. uh, And then we're going to finish here. Uh, 
This is from a, a theologian who I just really love. His name is Vinoth Ramachandra. He's from Sri Lanka, and I won't, that's all I'll say, but I'm going to read this because I think it's really awesome. And it's short. It's medium short. Not super short, but not long. Listen to this. But Jesus was also and continues to be a controversial figure. First in Jewish Palestine and then in the pagan Greco-Roman world, Jesus evoked attitudes of bewilderment, scorn, and indignation. Crucifixion, though widespread in the Roman Empire, was viewed with universal horror and disgust. It was cruel and degrading, the victim often being flogged and tortured before being strung up on a cross. It was the most humiliating form of death in the ancient world. The penalty reserved for rebellious slaves, dangerous criminals of the lower classes. Do you hear Luke chime in when he said, and they crucified Jesus alongside two criminals? Do you hear that here? That's where Jesus was. That's what he did. He deserved none of it. We deserved all of it, but he took our place. He died so we don't have to. No Roman citizen could be crucified. It's a privilege. Crosses with their gory exhibits were set up in busy, crowded road junctions to act as a deterrent to the masses. It was Rome's way of preserving the imperial status quo. It is the madness of this word of the cross that compels thoughtful men and women to take it seriously. Paul said, the gospel, it's foolishness, it's foolishness to the wise. You won't get there with your intellect. I would want to, this is Ramachandra again, I would want to argue that it is the very absurdity of the Christian message, then and now, then and now, that makes it ring true. And if true, then it changes everything. It turns upside down, Ramachandra writes, or is it right way up? (laughs) Our views of God and the world, of suffering and death, (laughs) it changes death, turns it upside down. Of the meaning of what we call religion and politics, and so much else. I talked about religious experiences at the beginning. It can be a little bit mystical. It's, it is real, I, I submit. People have real religious experiences. God does communicate with us. Um, God is also wonderfully and amazingly concrete. He's flesh and blood. Word became flesh and walked among us. You can read about it. We read about him in the Gospels. He's real. He's not just a mystical God. He's a real God, flesh and blood. When I was uh, a kid, I grew up up the street, uh, two years older than me, uh, a guy named John Lamotto. And I really loved John, a uh, tremendous athlete. I really kind of looked up to him. And... Uh, when I was in junior high school, three-year high school, seventh, eighth, ninth, he was a ninth grader. He was undefeated, and, you know, I got beat up pretty bad as a seventh grader wrestling. And, uh, but I, he helped me out a lot. And when I went to high school, he was a senior. He was our running back and a uh, wonderful guy. Uh, right, shortly after he graduated from high school, he got in a tragic car accident, and there were some deaths, and he was a vegetable, and he was not expected to live. And uh, he was in a coma for the longest time. And the first time I saw him after that was at a party, and I'm 18, and I see him, and he sees me, and I see life in his eyes, and he goes like this. And, uh, and so I went over, and I put down my ear, and he said, Donnie. That's what he called me, Donnie. He says, Jesus is real. That was communication, and there was tension, honestly, in my life. <laughs> I wasn't, like, I wasn't the kind of 18-year-old that, you know, wanted to go to church every Sunday and read my Bible and all that kind of stuff. I, I was having a fair amount of fun, right? So there was tension, but there was prophecy. There's a turning point. I'm standing here telling you something John Lamotto said. You know, I'm 62. That was a while ago. 
right? So there's the turning point. There's the patience. What you say and what we're called to be witnesses as your loved ones, as your friends, also be patient. Look for God. Where's God at? Look to participate with God rather than jump out ahead of him. Don't get behind. Look to him. Make communication and the tension. Walk into the tension. I know it's hard. It's hard for me too when somebody's really having a tough time or whatever to walk into that tension. You don't want to, right? But God calls us to. He calls us to walk into it because that's what he did for us, right? And keep turning to him. That's that rhythm. Communication. Tension. Turn to him. Turn to him. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to come and worship you. As we approach Christmas, we, we think about holidays, we think about family, we think about times that your name will be spoken. We just pray, Lord, that um, each and every moment of each and every day, you will speak to our hearts and uh, make us witnesses to you, Lord, and help us to, to just discipline ourselves to turn to you and be willing to listen to you knowing that you are the good God, the good Savior that you laid down your life that you uh, were gracious to each and every one that we read about, the woman by the well, the woman in adultery never were you condemning you said I didn't come into this world to condemn the world, I came to save it we thank you in Jesus name, Amen